thank you very much uh, for the invitation and I'm uh, I'm very happy to be with you today. Um, as to my background, uh, maybe a bit of an addition to what Ferry uh, said about me, uh, is that I'm ma mainly a political scientist. So this is why our edited book uh, uh, needed the cooperation of, uh, uh, of more uh, social science areas. So Anita Pelle from the University of Szeged uh, is an economist and Boglarka uh, is uh, from IR international relations so it was a uh, it was a it was a good cooperation uh, that we could um, uh, invite our our network uh, from the region when when we put together this book I'm going to try now to uh, share my presentation with you and um, please let me know if you can see it. Yes, yes we can. Okay, good, good, okay. So, um, very briefly, I would like to introduce uh, the book first, and then I would like to concentrate on our chapter uh, that is a, a kind of a peculiar and maybe surprising uh, topic, how Eurozone members shape and maybe the quality of democracy might inter uh, relate. And I, I wrote that article together with, uh, with a colleague of mine, a uh, PhD student, uh, Istvan Benedek, but I will come back to that later. So first the book, uh, actually, um, I got an invitation from the editor of this series you can see on the top of the book, Europa perspectives on the EU single market. And, uh, uh, and I said that, well, this is mainly economics. So um, uh, I, I really don't think I have an idea how to contribute to that series. And then I thought about a conference. Uh, it was a very long time ago, more than, more than 10 years ago. And, uh, and uh, I got uh, an, kind of an accidental invitation it was about uh, uh, the eurozone and the potentials of uh, uh, euro accession, the eurozone accession in East Central Europe, and uh, and I got an invitation as a as a political scientist, and I was thinking, okay, what what am I doing here? And uh, and the more I uh, uh, I uh, started to dig myself into into the topic, I realized that. Uh, at least half of this question is politics. So, uh, so of course, uh, the economic status, GDP, uh, the uh, finances, uh, inflation rates are, are important, but this is uh, just as much a political decision to go into the Eurozone. So uh, this is when I started to consider that uh, that also political scientists are uh, in place when uh, when we are looking at uh, at the eurozone, and also there was this puzzle that uh, we had this huge economic crisis starting in two thousand and eight. Uh, we know the story; it came in from the United States, but uh, but it hit the eurozone that. Uh, uh, that faced already uh, embedded structural problems. Uh, there was a lot of imbalances within the Eurozone, there are huge differences between the member states from Spain to Germany. Uh, and still uh, in the middle of the crisis, uh, East Central European countries did not stop to go in. So even then uh, in the middle of uh, uh, of one of the deepest crises in uh, uh, of the uh, in the history of the European Union, uh, East Central European countries still st uh, still thought that it is worth it, uh, and uh, and actually uh, the international literature did not really cover that story. Uh, when I put together the book proposal, I had to look up. Uh, as, as usual, uh, uh, publishers always ask for it. What, what is available in your topic? What are the uh, maybe competing books uh, and literature? 
Um, and and there, there is there is there was very few actually. Uh, everybody concentrated on the eurozone crisis. There are tons of books on the eurozone crisis, but nobody really uh, uh, gave an insight. Why is this happening? Why is it still attractive for Slovakia, for the Baltic countries, and so on? So we were uh, we were wondering uh, with my colleagues. Of course, I uh, I thought that uh, that this is something that uh, that needs broad expertise, and. Uh, uh, so we were wondering uh, whether it's economics that matters. Uh, is it the uh, the time of accession? So the more uh, the um, the earlier you enter the eurozone, the more inclined you are to uh, uh, to go in the eurozone. Uh, although it is not the case, as we see, the uh, the latest incomer Croatia is going to introduce the euro in uh, in 2023. So it doesn't matter whether you you joined in 2004 or 2015. Uh, is it popular support? Is it the people? Is it politicians that respond to a kind of a uh, a kind of a public uh, demand uh, that they are going in? Actually, no. In Croatia, uh, it is still not uh, uh, the. In, in Hungary, it is much higher uh, the support for uh, uh, for the uh, euro introduction. Uh, than in Croatia. So then, what's going on? And um, so we decided uh, that the, here is the map. So this is the current uh, uh, Eurozone membership. Uh, and, um, and the yellow countries are out fully. And, uh, and you see uh, from East Central Europe, you see Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, and Romania. Uh, and also yellow is Sweden, that is completely outside. And, uh, and in our, uh, our region, uh, you see Croatia and Bulgaria in the green, uh, which is in the, uh, in the ERM2 um, um, cooperation, which is kind of the forum of the Eurozone. So we see now that, especially after the accession of, uh, of Croatia, the majority of East Central Europe will be in the, uh, the Eurozone. And if Bulgaria follows soon, then, uh, then, um, then this majority uh, will even grow. So uh, the structure of the book, um, it is divided into two parts. It's quite simple. Uh, we looked at horizontal issues, uh, and of course, we did an introduction, a general introduction. Uh, Anita Pelle gave an insight to uh, kind of political economy theory. Uh, we invited Christian Schweiger from Chemnitz University, he's a political scientist. Uh, actually, he gave a quick uh, overview on. Uh, basically the history uh, of the Eurozone to put the, uh, the de new developments into perspective. Uh, our chapter with Istvan Benedik uh, that, that, uh, that I'm going to talk about is, uh, is also a different issue because uh, the quality of democracy in East Central Europe, as all of us know, is a hot topic. So we looked at whether it can be somehow connected to Eurozone membership or not. Uh, Kolej Boglarko, uh, a colleague of mine, a friend of mine who, who was also a co-editor of the book, uh, her main research focus is identity issues. Uh, so uh, she looked at whether um, uh, Eurozone members have kind of deeper EU identities or European identities than outside, but actually there is no correlation on that. So I, I'm sharing with you the results already, but it is worth reading also that, uh, also that chapter. Uh, and then this, uh, the, the next chapter is about uh, economic performance. So is, uh, uh, is Eurozone membership brings about a better economic performance than, uh, than staying outside. Um, the ch uh, seventh chapter is uh, on uh, microeconomics. So uh, it is about whether companies demand Eurozone membership in their daily business. Would it help if, if our countries were in? Or uh, is it better to, to trade uh, in, for uh, companies 
in Eurozone member states in, in our region. And uh, Mérő Katalin um, uh, wrote a chapter on the banking union that is, as you know, a tool um, yeah, that, uh, that was introduced after uh, the Eurozone crisis as a stabiliz uh, as a kind of a, a stabilizatory tool uh, for uh, uh, for banks, uh, bank authorities. And uh, uh, she is looking at uh, uh, in what what is the basis of joining uh, the banking union for those countries that especially who do not have to. Uh, because outside the Eurozone, you don't have to join the banking union. You may be, uh, 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 you may choose to do so, however. Okay. Uh, is there, uh, is there a problem with what you see? Okay. Uh, so, and then we have country studies. I do not want to spend a lot of time with it. It is, uh, well, maybe it's a kind of a V4 perspective, uh, as you see, because all the V4 countries uh, received an own chapter, probably because we all, all the editors are from Hungary, so our direct neighborhood was the most important for us, uh, and uh, well, we couldn't uh, uh, we couldn't uh, do separate chapters for each. Uh, East Central European countries. So we uh, we grouped some of them. Of course, we have uh, we have a separate chapter on the Baltic states. Uh, we have a very interesting comparative study on Slovenia and Croatia uh, because uh, Cro um, both are ex-Yugoslavian states. However, Slovenia went in the eurozone already years ago, and Croatia is about to join. Uh, so it is a it is a nice mainly uh, economic and financial uh, comparison. Uh, also, we have a great chapter uh, with the kind of leading expertise of Cornel Bahn, who is a very famous political economist and uh, just transferred from the UK to the Copenhagen Business School. And he is from Romania. And it is also a very, uh, a very insightful chapter on Bulgaria and Romania. And actually, what you uh, what you have as a uh, as a, a kind of a main finding on the basis of these chapters is that we cannot really group these countries. So we would think that uh, uh, Bulgaria and Romania joining the eurozone, being neighboring, joining the European Union at the same time, may, neighboring countries may show a very similar pattern. No, they are actually. Uh, one of the most diverse cases. So geographical proximity does not say anything. Uh, maybe um, as a uh, uh, maybe the Baltic states can uh, can bring an example for kind of regional similarities uh, in terms of uh, uh, eurozone accession. Well, so this is the book. Uh, I'm open to questions if you uh, if you have more about this general uh, uh, general part. Uh, but now I would like to uh, focus on uh, on our chapter that is about uh, democracy backsliding and uh, uh, and eurozone membership. So uh, actually, it's a two author papers. I want I would like to stress that, uh, but Istan is not here with us uh, at the moment, so I'm representing also him. Uh, so how did this question come uh, to the surface? Um, I just uh, gave a, a lecture yesterday uh, to our uh, second year students at the Political Science Institute and. Uh, we had the Eastern enlargement of the Euroso of the European Union uh, in in our focus, and uh, and I had to retell them the so-called Copenhagen criteria. Uh, and one of the Copenhagen criteria from 1993, kind of the starting point of uh, uh, of the Eastern enlargement of the European Union. Uh, uh, set uh, the quality of democracy or democracy as such uh, as a condition for uh, for accession. 
uh, but also we can expand that issue that uh, uh, that there were examples when uh, when the perspective of uh, of EU accession uh, did contribute to the uh, uh, to the enhancement of the, of democracy. Uh, we could bring Slovakia here as a as an example uh, because Slovakia, especially because of the Mecia regime in the 1990s could not get into the first round of negotiations uh, in the process of Eastern enlargement. So European, uh, so EU membership has always been connected to, uh, to the idea of democracy and the quality of democracy in our region. Uh, also uh, literature, uh, also political science discourse and political discourse is also full of this issue. Uh, that is about uh, democratic democratic backsliding. Uh, there is a uh, there is a huge um, uh, variety of definitions, but I think we can group them into two. Uh, one kind of bag of experts is uh, trying to find a definition. So what, what is this? Is this populist democracy, defective democracy, broken democracy, illiberal democracy, uh, electoral authoritarianism, maybe the most widespread or accepted is hybrid regime. Uh, the other set of, uh, uh, of uh, experts is trying to uh, find a name for the process. So is this the process of de-democratization? Uh, Janos Kornai uh, was writing ex, uh, writing uh, very recently uh, about the democratic U-turn and maybe democratic backsliding is uh, is used the most. So this is why we we did not want to enter into this discussion. What is it and how has it come about? Uh, so that's that was that was our uh, uh, one of our starting points. Uh, the other is uh, the Eurozone change after the crisis, because uh, obviously, and I think in the literature, it is a broad consensus uh, that uh, the Eurozone crisis uh, uh, was solved with having more Europe, with a deepening integration, especially on the, uh, uh, in, in the financial cooperation. So uh, banking union is one of the tighter policy regimes that were introduced in order to save the euro. So instead of national authorities, we have a European banking authority to monitor how, uh, how banks uh, uh, operate uh, because banks were one of the sources of the crisis. And, uh, and there is another uh, deepening uh, another more Europe type of new policy, and this is uh, and this is um, um, well represented. There are more tools, but uh, for the sake of simplicity, we can now only talk about the European semester. Uh, that is uh, a, a tool to monitor the fiscal policies, the the, the national uh, and government responsibilities. How they uh, how they do their finances? Uh, how do they manage their deficits? How much they borrow on the international markets? And this is a very serious monitoring system uh, on the from the Commission towards the member states. I will come back to that and bringing the 2019 Italian example later. So all in all, uh, the European uh, 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 the eurozone crisis brought about more shared sovereignty uh, in the Eurozone. So uh, on the basis of those two starting points, our research question was, uh, could democratic backsliding be more salient in non-Eurozone member states? Um, could it be true that it is, uh, it is more difficult to, uh, to cut back democratic features in countries uh, in EU member states that are on the outskirts on, uh, of the Eurozone that, uh, that, have, uh, that are not participating uh, in the deeper 
uh, type of integration represented by the Eurozone rules, especially after the new Eurozone rules uh, uh, introduced after the, uh, the crisis. So how did we work? Uh, we used the very controversial uh, democracy indices, and we are fully aware that none of them are perfect. All of more, uh, well, uh, uh, most of them are far from being perfect. And, uh, uh, and we also elaborated in our chapter uh, the flaws that they, uh, that they have. However, what I firmly believe is that uh, it is uh, most useful uh, to, uh, to look at them when, when we, are, uh, uh, we want to explore our previous selves. So if, if, we, if we look at longitudinal data, uh, we look at we don't want to uh, compare Hungary with Botswana because probably it doesn't really make sense. But we, if we want to look at Hungary in 2010 and 2020, uh, then uh, we mostly um, rely on the same uh, uh, same methodology. And uh, probably we can read something out of those graphs that they will, that these data will uh, will draw. Uh, actually, I uh, we we did quite a few. Uh, I only brought uh, two uh, graphs here. One is the Freedom House Nations in Transit Index, uh, and the other is uh, is VDEM. Well, VDEM is uh, uh, is actually probably the most sophisticated out of these. Uh, 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 these indices, especially because you can put together your own database on the, uh, you, can, you can choose what type of democracy uh, you are looking for. And uh, we, we used uh, the, uh, the data for electoral democracy. So uh, I'm going to show you those two, um, uh, those two graphs. And uh, in order to visualize, uh, I know it's not very uh, good because it's not colored, but because of the book, uh, we could not use colors in our graph. So I'm, I still hope that, uh, that it is visible. So what we see is uh, uh, we put uh, Eurozone member states uh, with dotted lines and non-Eurozone member states uh, as continuous lines. So, uh, so what, you, what we see is that uh, all, Europe, uh, all Eurozone members in East Central Europe are on the top of the chart. And for example, you see Slovakia. Uh, where is my mouse? Uh, you see Slovakia here uh, that actually headed for decline and it stopped in 2009. Um, I'm not saying that this was because of your accession in 2009. It might have to do with other factors as well. Mostly it is so because uh, we never have uh, just a one reason phenomenon, uh, but this is interesting. Uh, also we see uh, Poland and Hungary as the, as the steepest, in, in a steepest decline. Uh, but we also see the Czech Republic outside the Eurozone, uh, but not in decline. As we see, there was a change in government recently in the Czech Republic. Uh, so then that does not seem to be uh, well, serious uh, systematic challenges to, uh, uh, to democracy throughout our examined periods that, that started in 2003. And our last data is from 2019. Uh, if we use the VDEM table, and I'm going to jump to my, uh, my next slide, uh, it is kind of similar. Um, looking at uh, well, having different kind of raw materials, but we see uh, um, um, Hungary and, uh, and uh, Poland in Again, steep decline. Actually, we also see Croatia in a uh, in a steep decline after 2016, 
and uh, and uh, I think the uh, we will have uh, the um, kind of a, a try to our little theory after uh, Croatia goes in uh, the eurozone whether there will be a systemic difference after 2013 or maybe even before. Uh, we see the same phenomenon here with the dotted lines uh, in the case of Eurozone members. Uh, and, uh, and we see the Czech Republic as non-declining uh, in terms of democracy as a non-Eurozone member state. Uh, actually, we also uh, did an, uh, another, um, looked at another database, and that is the Economist Intelligence Unit. Um, and uh, uh, in the in our paper, there is a relatively detailed presentation of how uh, how how these uh, these indices work. But we made we made a different visualization of uh, uh, of the EU member states and eurozone member states. Uh, so we use this division of old member states. Uh, new member states and also eurozone members and non-eurozone members, and uh, and I'm going to show this uh, to you. And this is uh, this is in the book. Uh, I think we can ignore uh, the top and the bottom line, which is non non-EU and non-eurozone member states in 2020, which is I don't know uh, uh, um, Switzerland and uh, a Norway, so these are <clears throat> very exceptional, uh, typically West European countries, and uh, non-member Eastern European states, uh, and you have, you, you have them here listed in the, uh, in the footnote, so it is Russia, Serbia, there was a serious drop. But of course, uh, we are interested in, uh, in EU member states. And uh, I would like to draw your attention, of course, to, uh, to um, new EU member states. So after joining the, Euros, uh, the European Union from 2004 on, there was a general decline in, uh, uh, in terms of the quality of democracy, according to Economist Intelligence Unit data. However, uh, there is a huge difference between EU, EU and Eurozone members in our region uh, and new EU member states, but non-Eurozone member states. So uh, if we only take those member states from our region who join the Eurozone, the decline is 0.9%. And, uh, and the, oh, I'm oh, sorry. And... Uh, uh, EU, EU member states from our, from our region who are not Eurozone member states, you see a deeper decline, a lot deeper uh, decline. So how can we explain all this? Um, actually, uh, we went to an ECPR uh, joint session of workshops with this, uh, with this paper. And uh, we received a uh, very interesting uh, comments and criticisms. And uh, one of the, uh, the leading motives of this, it was that, oh, you know, this is all counterintuitive because, uh, because during the Eurozone crisis, we saw that uh, Eurozone members um, accused uh, the European Union and Eurozone to kill democracy. So what did the European Union do in, um, uh, in Greece? And uh, what, uh, uh, and I, I, would, I would like to come back that I promised before, uh, the, the Italian case. Uh, it was um, maybe in the footnote of, uh, of the news at that time, uh, but, but I think it's very telling. At, uh, around the end, of, um, of 2019, uh, and it was still 
Salvini uh, was was still a member of the government, and he was the one who uh, represented this sovereignist attitude. And uh, the government was about to put together uh, the budget for Italy, and uh, and the government decided um, as a pressure from Salvini and his party uh, that uh, they they need to um, uh, they need to have uh, to invest and spend more uh, than the rules of the eurozone so they will have a bigger budget deficit than it is allowed by uh, by the common rules uh, but uh, but the Italian government, well, represented the uh, the attitude that well we don't care, we just need this uh, kind of freedom, and uh, and of course they entered into this uh, this harsh debate with the European Commission. They received uh, uh, criticisms and they received quite, quite uh, well. Um, uh, they received advice to uh, to cut back on the deficit level. And uh, so it went on and on. Uh, the European Commission represented the idea that, you know, these are the common rules. You also accepted that. Uh, you are part of this, uh, uh, this project. And, uh, and uh, well, we are, uh, we, it is our task to, uh, to safeguard the, those because uh, if not, we will end up again as in the middle of a crisis similar what kind of what what used to what was caused sort of by uh, by Greece? Uh, on the other hand, Italy represented the uh, um, well uh, rep um, represented their ideas that you know we are a sovereign country. Uh, it is our uh, it is our parliament, our directly elected parliament, who is deciding on our budget, and it is not the European Commission. So uh, at the end of the day, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, actually the European Commission won. Uh, Italy cut back on the deficit level. Uh, the budget was accepted around Christmas, so it was kind of far later than uh, than usual. And the reason was uh, that the financial markets uh, were trying to increase were uh, were increasing. Uh, the uh, uh, the international uh, uh, well the oh, how, how do you call it uh, they were increasing so Italy had would have difficulties in in borrowing in terms of uh, uh, on 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 the short run if they uh, if they needed uh, to borrow money for the for budgetary purposes so. Um, um, so that was my that was the uh, the the argument that uh, you know the Euro, eurozone except, uh, itself uh, damages uh, uh, democracy and not maintains it as as uh, as we suggest. But well, I believe that uh, it is a sovereignty issue. It is much more of a sovereignty issue uh, than a democracy issue. Uh, because uh, because it is uh, it is about uh, who does what and not how the country is managed. Also, uh, it might not be kind of true. There might not be uh, a correlation because uh, there there is no direct EU tools in order to maintain democracy with the help of the eurozone so there is no intention to uh, to maintain democracy the quality of democracy uh, with eurozone membership and also uh, a, there is a counter argument that there is uh, that there, are, there is backsliding also in uh, uh, in eurozone member states in its central europe however uh, we still uh, are willing to defend our position. First, because we saw that the decline in uh, Eurozone member states in terms of quality of democracy is much slow, much uh, smaller uh, than outside the Eurozone. So 
uh, less shared sovereignty still seems to uh, give a flow uh, to uh, to governments to to manage their uh, their their democracies uh, as they wish. So uh, of course we need to do, and uh, and this is our next steps. Uh, to actually identify and find out those tools that uh, that are contributing or might contribute to uh, to this process, and uh, and we uh, suggest that the tools of the eurozone uh, stability uh, uh, stabilization uh, are uh, are to explore uh, from this perspective uh, to find uh, answers to. Uh, to our little uh, uh, idea. Uh, so, so actually, I think that we uh, we did not identify causality, uh, but a potential correlation. So, uh, so we we do not say that you know you go in the eurozone and you stay democratic. Uh, we do not say that you know you stay outside the eurozone and you fall back on democracy. Uh, we say we say that there might be. A correlation, because we have uh, an example when outside the eurozone there is no uh, uh, no fallback on democracy. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we see no eurozone countries where we witness such a uh, such a steep decline in the quality of democracy. So, uh, as I said, and this is my last sentence, um, that. Uh, Eurozone will be the try of the pudding, and um, uh, as uh, as a new member state from 2023 uh, in the eurozone, and we will see how this process correlates or not with the quality of democracy in the country. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, this was my contribution uh, to you today.